Intel's Rocket Lake family of chips was honestly a disappointing release for many of us who have historically expected big things from one of the largest semiconductor corporations on the planet. Before Rocket Lake launched though, I actually had a video planned and partially written on Intel's 14 nanometer lithographic node, discussing the differences in transistor layouts between the different 14 nanometer generations. It's actually a little known fact, but Intel, in order to attain the higher clock speeds in Coffee Lake and Comet Lake, actually had to make their node less dense as time went on, and they're following suit with their 10 nanometer superfin, which launched late last year. So if 14 nanometer is so heavily optimized, why is it holding Intel back, not only in terms of design, but also economics? If you remember back to the Comet Lake video I released just over a year ago, I sort of tore down 14 nanometer and made it seem to be some sort of old and archaic technology. While it technically is a 5 year old node now, its performance is actually still incredibly competitive at the cost of power consumption. Now, a lot of this has to do with the insane clock speeds that Intel are pushing through their newer chips, which allows Intel to maintain snappy performance since the chip is able to sample movements and the like at a quicker rate. This though requires tons of power to maintain, hence why the i9-11900K is drawing 332 watts in some cases when AVX512 is taxed and why the TDP ratings for this generation of chips is so much higher than we're used to. Even though it's easy to target Intel for their power draw, I think what's more interesting is how we got here. Because if you remember back to KB Lake and the first generation of Skylake, clocks were lower and power consumption was much more under control. If we want to go back to the very first generation of 14 nanometer chips, we'd actually have to jump back to Broadwell, which launched almost exclusively in the high-end market with only a single i5 and i7 chip being released on desktop. Either way, this iteration of 14 nanometer was the most dense, with just over 37.5 million transistors per square millimeter, with a transistor gate pitch of 70 nanometers. With 14 nanometer plus plus, this was increased to 84 nanometers, giving us an overall larger transistor, which allows for more drive, hence the higher clock speeds. This means that Intel's 14 nanometer process is now roughly equivalent to Global Foundry's 14 nanometer in terms of actual transistor density. However, Intel's process is able to clock much higher. TLDR, Intel lowered transistor density in pursuit of higher clocks. And in retrospect, I'm actually glad that they did so, as it's kind of satisfying to see your chip hit 5 GHz. It also allowed for a 5.3 GHz turbo clock in the case of the 11900K. However, running the chip at those speeds for an elongated period of time has the propensity to make your chip rather toasty. It's not to say that Rocket Lake runs particularly warm at stock settings, it's more illustrative of 14 nanometers age, and this combined with the extra sunny cove logic makes for densely packed chips with tons of heat generating components. It's a tough problem to solve, but Intel was able to work around it in Comet Lake by actually increasing the IHS thickness, allowing it to soak up more heat. Rocket Lake improved upon this, and combined with the die thinning technique introduced in Comet Lake, it really helps to improve clock speeds through making the chip easier to cool. Another design decision Intel went for with Comet Lake was to actually build the die wider rather than taller. This like die thinning makes heat transfer much more efficient, meaning it's easier to cool since the heat produced by the transistors has less vertical space to go before it leaves the chip and transfers into your cooler. It's actually kind of interesting how the IHS has evolved over the years, especially recently. For years, Intel was using a squared spreader, which was sort of hard to distinguish between the generations, but they recently changed it to be much more rectangular with the 11th gen parts. And I've got to say that I think it looks cool. It's easy to tell a Rocket Lake chip apart from other chips, and it's a nice thing to have when you handle multiple CPUs a day. Now to actually print the chips, Intel uses a self-aligned double patterning technique which means that for each feature, the wafer must be exposed twice in order to properly resolve the circuitry. If you think lining up something perfectly and scanning it twice sounds hard, try quad patterning, meaning you're doing it for four exposures. And it's actually what's been giving them so much trouble. Alright, now that we've got the specifications of 14 nanometer out of the way, let's dive into Rocket Lake and take a look under the hood to see exactly what went wrong here. Let's move out from a microscopic view to a macroscopic one, and analyze Cypress Cove as a whole. 
The first thing I'd like to mention is that the Co family of architectures is Intel's first node agnostic attempt at solving the problematic process architecture optimization model they adopted a few years ago. Instead, it went process architecture optimized for three generations, then back to architecture. I know it's kind of confusing, but try to think of Rocket Lake and the Cypress Cove cores it features as a backport, sort of like how video games must be ported to the Xbox One and PS4, despite the newer Xbox Series X and PS5 existing. Not everyone will be able to get access to the new consoles, so utilizing the older hardware to accomplish the same task is the smartest and most economical choice. Cypress Cove is actually based on the earlier Sunny Cove core, and according to Intel themselves, entered design in early 2019 which coincides with when Ice Lake was leaving its design phases. Ice Lake featured Sunny Cove cores, so it honestly makes sense how the team that designed the core would design the back port. Thankfully, the team was able to keep all the features of Sunny Cove, AVX 512 included, as well as the restructured cache found in Ice Lake. What's kind of confusing to me at this point though is why did Intel not release their 8-core Tiger Lake on the desktop? I understand that 10 nanometer is exclusive to the mobile and enterprise markets at the moment, but it features nearly identical specifications to the i9-11900K, and its performance is actually competitive with AMD's mobile beast that is Renoir. Either way, what we ended up with was a Sunny Cove core retrofitted to run on 14 nanometer, along with some optimizations made to improve clocks. 14 nanometer has different design rules to 10 nanometer, with the largest differences being an actual transistor layout and density. However, some of the structures that were possible on 10 nanometer either require more power or don't scale properly, requiring a redesign of certain components in the chip. This explains why the chip is so power hungry and why the actual die itself is so large, despite only packing 8 cores. Some of the other pieces that affect performance include cache and the latency that an increase in it comes with, as well as the insanely high clock speeds, can actually be beneficial and also detrimental to the performance of the chip. Specifically speaking, the L1 and L2 caches grew in size with the move to Cypress Cove, and with a larger cache comes higher latencies for retrieving or writing data, especially so with pieces of data commonly stored in said caches. This can ultimately slow down your processor in the long run, but is more than made up for by introducing an additional 56 load and 16 extra store units over what was found in Skylake, along with two extra execution ports, giving us 10 per core. This is what's allowing for the additional 19% claimed IPC over Skylake, and for the most part, this is true, as the 8-core 11900K is able to match the 10900K, which packs two more cores. It's impressive from an architectural standpoint, and to be honest, I'm more interested in the tech of these chips than I am the actual, well, chips this release cycle. And even though I have a budget Rocket Lake review coming, it'll be some time before I'm comfortable enough with the processor to make an informed review. However, getting back into the chip's design, from an architectural perspective, Cypress Cove and Sunny Cove are nearly identical, and the cores themselves actually have almost identical floor plans. Things such as AVX 512, which hogs a nice chunk of die space, are a nice inclusion, and I'm interested to see how it improves performance. Now this all begs the question, why? Why would Intel release a product that was this poorly received? Well, moving forward, Intel is designing their architectures to be node agnostic, Meaning that from Rocket Lake forward, Intel is designing their cores to be able to scale between 10 nanometer, the future 7 nanometer, and 14 nanometer. So if they really wanted to, they could print all their consumer desktop chips on 14 nanometer. That's not likely to happen, however I do have one theory as to why Intel released this product. First, they gained tons of experience on ensuring internode compatibility, and as a result, these sorts of issues, like power, will be worked out as we move forward and will allow for more flexibility when it comes to manufacturing their chips. Second, I suspect that Alder Lake, if it's on DDR5, is going to go the way of Intel's 5th generation core processors, which were the first DDR4 compatible Broadwell chips. I personally think Rocket Lake is meant to be the company's last hurrah for DDR4, and as such, designed the chips to be cheaper and abundant, hence 14 nanometer, as well as this offering an actual per-core performance uplift so that Skylake can finally take a break from fighting off AMD's Zen. For Alder Lake though, window scheduling would need to be properly worked out for a heterogeneous design, with certain tasks migrating between threads. However, we aren't sure how the algorithm judges the importance hierarchy and distributes tasks. This could all be totally wrong, and for all I know Alder Lake could be an absolutely killer product. However, with all the issues that present themselves when discussing heterogeneous compute, it seems like it would be a headache to properly implement. 
Either way, I'm still interested, but back onto Rocket Lake. I was intentionally trying to look at things from a performance perspective, and in the process did not go over power consumption as much as I'd like to, or the new graphics architecture introduced with this generation. I've brought up all these great things, like the extra execution ports, extra cache, and higher clocks, but they all require more power, which is why power consumption figures are so bad this time around. I'm confident Intel will be able to work this out in future architectures, but for what we have in front of us, it's pretty impressive, and lots of credit is due to the engineers that poured their heart and souls into these products, especially during the pandemic. I'm excited to finish my review on the i5-11400 in the near future, and I can't wait to see what Alder Lake brings to the table.